it is difficult for many people to believe in ghosts, and this is understandable, for we tend to accept only what we can see and hear with our normal senses. In our day-to-day -day lives, we're unlikely to come up against paranormal happenings, and yet, from time to time, strange events take place, which seem to verge on fantasy. Often, these events happen when we least expect them, and it's not necessary for the traditional bewitching hour of midnight to animate the ghosts, and it's not necessary for the locations to be the hallowed ground of some ancient churchyard or burial place. Ghosts can show up at any time of day or night, often in the most unlikely places, and they can take many forms. Some people just don't believe in them, and this is probably because they've never seen one. They will argue that should a friend see something paranormal, that it was a figment of imagination, existing only in the mind of the beholder, and they'll come up with theories to explain away the phenomena. Perhaps the person seeing a ghost was daydreaming, or perhaps he created the image by self-hypnosis, combined with an over-enthusiastic imagination. But we're going to prove to you that ghosts really do exist, for you're going to hear them on this tape. And what you hear are not figments of imagination or the results of self-hypnosis, for they were recorded via the medium of a microphone and a tape recorder. The microphone cannot operate in silence, it has a diaphragm which moves in time with the movement of the air when a sound is generated. It's rather like a loudspeaker in reverse. It cannot record figments of imagination, and this is not subject to hypnosis or telepathy. It relies upon physical sound to function. It is possible, under certain circumstances, for a tape recorder to act as a radio receiver. And under the right conditions, they can record programs originating from broadcast stations. But the sounds you're about to hear do not in any way resemble radio program material. And at the time when these recordings were made, there were no stations transmitting material of this nature. It must also be admitted that recordings of this type could be faked. But we promise you that what you hear are genuine recordings presented exactly as they happened. And we assure you that they are in no way faked. The story which follows has been investigated by BBC radio and television presenters and has been broadcast around the world. It has caused quite a stir wherever it has been heard. And it raises the question, are there such things as earthbound spirits? And do the dead really live on in another state of existence, sometimes trying desperately to draw attention to themselves? Now here is the recording of events exactly as they happened. Situated about 16 miles from King's Lynn in Norfolk, near the East Anglian coast, lies Bircham Newton, the site of a Royal Air Force aerodrome which has survived two world wars. It was originally built in 1914, but today it's owned by the Construction Industry Training Board, serving as a base for the many courses they run to train building operatives. It was here, under the most unlikely conditions, that the first psychic event took place. A film crew were at work in what had once been the old officer's mess. They were producing a management training film, a very down-to-earth subject, when quite suddenly one of the heavy studio lamps started to topple over without anybody touching it. Peter Clark, a member of the film crew, was standing beneath it, and by all rights it should have brained him. But just as it was about to hit him, it swerved to the right, as if pulled by some unseen hand, and then crashed across a table quite undamaged. There was no apparent reason for this happening, and as it took place during the filming of a scene, everyone in the room was standing motionless at the time. When the lamp had been placed upright again, it was found that there was still a coil of loose cable beneath the base, so no one had tripped or pulled on this wire. On its own, this accident would have brought forth little comment, but when connected with the events which follow, it takes on a more interesting aspect. Just behind the officer's mess is a squash court, which was built during the First World War. And it was here that another member of the film unit had a terrifying experience. After discovering the existence of the court, he thought he'd like to play a game of squash, and arranged to borrow a bat and a ball from the sports officer, and was loaned the only key to the building. 
He asked if any of the members of the film unit would like to join him, but as no one was interested, he set off to play on his own. There are two courts placed side by side, and at first he amused himself in the left-hand one. Then, for no particular reason, he decided to have a go in the right-hand court, and was soon devoting all his attention to trying to hit the ball. While this was going on, he heard footsteps walk along the viewing gallery behind him, and at first he didn't pay much attention to them, as he imagined that one of the members of the film crew had come to watch him play. And then, suddenly, he realised that he'd locked himself into the building and was completely alone. For a moment, he stood silent. And then he heard a sigh, which made the hairs on his neck prickle. And turning round, he saw a man in RAF uniform staring at him from the gallery. And then the figure vanished. The experience terrified him, and he immediately fled from the building. Later that night, he confided his experience to Peter Clark, who suggested that they should return to the squash court with the film unit's professional tape recorder to try and capture the footsteps on tape. They didn't get the footsteps, but what they did obtain was one of the most amazing psychic recordings ever made. We asked Peter Clark why they decided to visit the building at night. The main reason, really, was because it was quiet, as we were taking the tape recorder with us. What time of night was this? About 11.30. What sort of weather conditions were there? Calm, still warm summer night. What was the atmosphere like when you visited this building? There are two courts, side by side. We first went in the one on the left, which I can only really describe as normal. Then we in investigated the rest of the building and searched everywhere to see if there was anybody in there. And then we went in to this one on the right, and the atmosphere was so frightening, so cold in there, uh, that it was just like stepping into another world, almost. Was this the court your colleague saw the ghost of the airman in? Yes, that's right. That, uh, this was the one that we'd come to investigate. And we put the tape recorder on the floor and set the tape on it and we debated whether to stay in the building or not and we were so frightened that we we thought we'd just leave it running and lock it in there and come back when the tape had run out And so you left the machine running for about, what, half an hour or so? Yes, I think it was about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, could you see the door or the entrance to the court? Oh, yes, yes, we saw that. We, could, we got the building in plain sight all the time. It was a uh, moonlit night. And then you returned to collect the machine? Yes, and we, we uh, opened the door and walked in just as the, the tape ran out. And as we were bending over the machine to switch it off, we heard these footsteps along the viewing gallery. Immediately we thought, oh, somebody must have been in here. And then we realised that we'd checked the place. And as we stood there looking, the, the footsteps progressed further along the gallery and we could see there was nobody there. And of course, by this time, we were so keyed up and frightened that we just literally, we grabbed the recorder and ran. Now you're going to hear extracts from that recording. The volume control had been set for whispered speech and so the sounds are recorded at a very low level. We've amplified them, and because of this, they're accompanied by considerable tape mush. In the first extract, you'll hear some metallic sounds, and if you listen carefully, you can hear the drone of a piston engine aircraft flying over. And yet, not only were there no aircraft flying in the area that night, there were no metallic objects within the building capable of producing these sounds.
From time to time, the recorder picked up the sounds of muffled speech. And here, a woman's voice can be heard, just after a metallic ping, which sounds not unlike a spoon being tapped. This is so remarkable, we've repeated it three times. There were noises as though heavy objects were being moved around. And coupled with odd bits of conversation, they give the impression that one is listening to the everyday sounds in a hangar in wartime. next sound is perhaps the most frightening of all. We've absolutely no explanation as to what made it or what it represents. The master tape of these recordings was passed to the BBC and they analysed it thoroughly. This is what one of their engineers had to say about it. Well, I've listened to it myself and talked to a number of my BBC colleagues with wide experience of recording, and collectively we are very puzzled, and we can't offer any simple, clear explanation. Could there be some sort of technical explanation, some reason how these sounds might have got onto the tape? There are certain possibilities. The tape itself could have had a previous recording on it, but I understand that this, in fact, was uh, a new piece of tape, so this is unlikely. Um, it is possible that these noises could have been recorded from outside. Um, I think that this is not possible because I understand uh, the building has a nine-inch brick wall, and although certain sounds could come in, these are too clear and metallic, I think, to have been recorded from outside. I think we can rule out any internal noises generated in the recorder itself. There's no fault condition known to me in a recorder that would generate um, uh, this kind of thing. I think we can say that these noises have been definitely recorded through the recorder microphone onto the machine. We confirmed with Peter Clark that a brand new roll of tape had been used, so there was no possibility of a previous recording breaking through. We asked him if they did any further investigation on the site. Yes, well, we, we held a seance there with a, a medium, and uh, he went into trance, and produced this, this dead airman, the voice of a dead airman. It was, it was extraordinary, really, because his, his face was all sort of twisted up, and he seemed to have difficulty in breathing. Leave us your name. Uh, no, no. Uh, no. Leave us your name. Give us your name. Can you give us your name? Wiley. Wiley? Now this was quite remarkable. For after a couple of months, we contacted a local newspaper. And upon checking the files, it turned out there was an airman called Wiley who'd committed suicide on the aerodrome during the last war. Our investigation also showed that the aerodrome had been haunted for many years. And this was not just an isolated incident. In recent years, a man attending one of the construction industry courses had his bedclothes pulled off him at night by some invisible being. Another had his curtains torn down and thrown across the room. And a senior engineer told us that he'd been tapped on the shoulder three times while working in the attic of the officer's mess. And yet, there was nobody else up there at the time. 
The experience so unnerved him, he refused to work there again. And yet another man claimed he saw a figure in RAF uniform walk through a solid wall which had been erected since the end of the last war. He was so frightened he refused to complete his course and left the following day. The record shows that one of the windows located near the officer's mess is continually being broken, yet there seems to be no logical reason why this happens. As the experts say, if the construction industry glazers cannot replace the windows properly, then nobody can. But that window seems reluctant to remain intact. During our investigation, we questioned many members of the staff. And the more we probed, the more stories we unearthed. It seemed common knowledge that strange events were continually taking place at Bircham Newton. There was the case of the radiators in the officer's mess being turned off in the middle of the night. The stopcock was located in a bedroom in a recess in the wall, and in order to get to it, a cover held in place by six brass screws had to be removed. The cover plate was hidden behind a wardrobe. It seems unlikely that anybody would take the trouble to move the wardrobe, find a screwdriver and remove the six screws in order to turn the water off. And yet, this happened four nights running during cold winter weather. The psychic sounds you've heard were broadcast on the Jack DeMagno programme by the BBC. And as a result, a large number of listeners wrote in. Among the letters received were several from people who'd been stationed at the aerodrome during the last war. And it seemed that even then strange things took place. One man stated that it was common knowledge that the ghost of an airman was frequently seen about the place. It also seems to have been an unlucky aerodrome to be stationed at. In the early part of the war, the American Air Force moved in, and they mounted their first daylight raid over France from Bircham Newton. They dispatched 13 aircraft, but not one of them ever returned. Among the letters the BBC received were a number from pet owners who said that their animals had reacted very strangely to the psychic sounds from the squash court. Some said their dogs and cats showed signs of fear. It seems almost unbelievable that a cat or a dog could sense something abnormal in a radio broadcast. They couldn't have understood the dialogue as human beings would, so, what upset them? We know that dogs can hear higher frequency sounds than human beings, but it's highly unlikely that these high frequencies could be reproduced on the average domestic radio set. This raised the question that if the tape was broadcast for a second time, would the animals react again? It was decided to try an experiment, and one of the local British radio stations agreed to cooperate and broadcast the sounds. The animals obliged for the second time, and many listeners wrote to the station to confirm this. One little girl explained that she had two dogs, and they both reacted. Gillian, now your dogs, tell me what happened when your dogs heard the noise. You've got two, haven't you, an old station and a mongrel. What did the mongrel do when it heard these ghost noises? Under the cupboard. So it heard the noises and shot away and hid itself in fright. Yeah. And what happened to the old station? Oh, I said she, she looked up to the radio and her fur went straight up. So it had some effect on her as well? Yes. The Bertram Newton story created great interest in many quarters. And shortly after it was broadcast, BBC Television took an interest in it. They decided to do their own investigation, and we were invited to join them at the aerodrome. They arrived accompanied by two prominent members of a leading British spiritualist society. When we first visited the squash courts, they entered the left one, and, after a brief look round, declared that there was nothing abnormal about the place. But as soon as they entered the right-hand court, they became excited, and claimed that it held a presence, although they didn't know that this was the one where the tape had been recorded and the ghost had materialised. It certainly did have an atmosphere, and compared with the left court, it was frightfully cold. And when we left the building a few minutes later, they commented on this. But they also claimed they'd both sensed the spirit of a dead airman in the building. Right, back of his car in front it's of mine. true. I'm warmer out there than I am in there. It's pretty low, isn't it? It's warmer right here. Big. No, it didn't. I think you said that your feet and your ankles. Yeah, that's, that's my cold. 
The longer I stand Did you send something? Sir? Hey? Did you send something? Yeah, I just sent it. I haven't sent it, John. I just sent it, John. I, I, as I know how one of them went. Who's, who's in there now? But they come over very strong in there. I see, I was walking towards the door to come out. Suddenly I was spewed around and I faced the wall again. And I thought, why? And I looked at this wall and I expected something to happen, but nothing did. I got this terribly icy feeling with my feet. There. By God, it's colder than when you get it. When you get it, you know it's not imagination because it's uh, strength. One of the spiritualists was a very well known and trusted medium, the late John Sutton. He told us there was a lot of psychic power being generated in the building. And he decided to go back inside again to meditate. But as soon as we entered the squash court, he was entranced, apparently by this dead airman. We had an accident. We had an accident. Save you, yes. Yes, we will, we're here to save you. Tell us. I can hear you, yes. Tell us what happened. Hmm? Tell us what happened. Fire. The, yeah. the plane caught fire. And it crashed. Yes. Where, where did it crash? Do you remember? Here? Near. Near here. Near. Church? Near the church? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. All oh, right, we've got that. Dusty Miller. Come on. Dusty Miller. Dusty Miller. Uh, Dusty Miller. Uh, Pat Sullivan. Pat Sullivan. Yes. Jerry Arnold? Jerry Arnold. Jerry Arnold. Help us. What can we do? Help us. Help us. What can we do? Well, you know, you know. Can you hear me? You know you've left the earth behind. In the plane you died. Do you remember that? But look up. Don't be afraid. Let go of the earth. Let go of the earth. You understand? You don't belong here. Yes. Look up. Ask for help. Upwards. And go towards the light. But you're holding yourself down. And tell that to Jerry. To Dusty. And to Pat Sullivan. John Sutton explained that while he was entranced, he learned the three airmen had all been keen squash players, and the courts had become a sort of mecca for them. He told us that they'd made a pact that if anything should ever happen to them, they'd try to meet up again in this building. He also told us that they'd been burnt to death in a crash when their aircraft, an Avro Anson, had crashed behind a church which had a tower but no steeple. He thought the church must be somewhere in the vicinity, but as he'd never visited the area before, he couldn't confirm the actual location. He explained to us that very often people do not realize what has happened when they die, because they feel quite normal. But they find that they cannot communicate with the living. Their sense of time is quite different, and they don't measure it as we do. He said that these three airmen had been held earthbound at Bertram Newton, because they had no idea they'd been killed in that crash. He was quite convinced that the psychic happenings around the aerodrome were the result of their attempts to try and draw attention to themselves, for they desperately needed help. Towards the end of the seance, John Sutton's features seemed to change, and he took on the appearance of an old man. This, we were told later, was his spirit guide manifesting. This is his helper. God bless you. And you, my children, I give thanks for the help which you have given my medium and those on this side of life. Are they all right now? They are at this time Good. now being helped. Good. And it has been almost 30 years that this help has been sought for. 
and at last they can now be happy. Yes, you will hear of no more disturbances, and should you hear of any such stories, then you will know indeed that this is but the person's own mind. I give thanks to you all for the help that you have given. We're pleased to do it. God bless you. God bless you. As to whether or not the medium was controlled by a spirit guide, we should probably never know. However, we were quite certain that John Sutton had never visited Bertram Newton before. And we were astonished to find out during a later investigation that an RAF Anson did crash in flames behind Bertram Church, killing the crew of three. And what is more remarkable is that Bertram Church has a tower but no steeple, although the majority of the churches in the area all have steeples. We would very much like to check the names given in this seance, but unfortunately, government regulations will not allow us access to the aerodrome logbooks and records. For the time being, these three names must, unfortunately, remain in limbo. But the spiritualists were quite certain that from this moment onwards, the psychic happenings would cease. But did they? Unknown to us, the Jack DeManio radio program decided to send a reporter down to Bertram Newton to make a further investigation. And they chose a lady called Rita Dando, who had her feet very much on the earth. She arrived at the aerodrome later the same day. But as we'd already left, we didn't have an opportunity to meet her, and so she was not aware that, in theory, the hauntings had ceased. She interviewed some of the staff of the training board, and then arranged to borrow the squash court key, with the intention of spending part of the night in the building. She was accompanied by a lady friend, and to make certain that nobody could pull their legs, they locked themselves into the building. She was quite convinced there must be a natural explanation for the psychic happenings, but she was in for a nasty shock. That was the sound of the locked door flying open and slamming shut, which she recorded from inside the squash court. She said that this happened three times, despite the fact that the catch was down. There was no way that door could have been opened from the outside. And of course, she had the only key to the building with her. Apart from her friend, there were no other human beings in the place. She then attempted to make a recording of the atmosphere inside the building, but her tape recorder refused to function, a thing which has never happened before, and no matter what she did, she couldn't make it operate. Somewhat shaken, the two ladies returned to their hotel, only to find that the tape recorder was now working perfectly again. We have no explanation to offer for these events. All we can say is that they happened exactly as you've heard. There have been many theories put forward to account for the noises. They range from sounds of birds to practical jokers. But the most popular one is that the building itself created the sounds due to temperature changes but the experts of the Construction Industry Training Board investigated this possibility and found that at the time when the sounds occurred, the building temperatures would have stabilised. And although they tried to repeat the experiment by leaving tape recorders running inside, they only succeeded in picking up the natural ambience of the place. And this sound in no way resembled the recordings you've heard on this tape. Could it be then that we've been privileged to establish contact with the dead? The location of the squash courts would certainly add to this theory, for adjacent to the buildings were the original mess huts dating back to the 1418 war, the hospital and the mortuary. <laughs>